UFC Fight Night Atlantic City, New Jersey, Blanchfield versus Fiorot takes place this weekend, and I'm going to go through the entire card, starting with the early prelims, ending with the main event, giving my prediction and breakdown for every single fight on the card, starting with the early prelim opener of Angel Pacheco versus Cowlin Lochran. Um, I think that Cowlin Lochran's going to win this fight. I think he wins it dominantly. I think he's going to be able to get to his dominant positions in the grappling. Um, I do like Angel Pacheco's body work. I do like his cardio. I like his conditioning. But I think Cowlin Lochran's going to be able to out-explosivity him early on. Not with shots on the feet. I didn't like the stand-up of Cowlin Lochran, to be honest with you guys. But um, he's going to have someone who's there for him. You know what I mean? I didn't like the stand-up of Cowlin Lochran because he was fighting Taylor Lapulus, who was out of range, dancing around, doing pit patter stuff, and giving him a tough time. Um, but Angel Pacheco is going to be there in the pocket, and I think that's going to open up too many opportunities for Cowlin Lochran to get his takedowns, end up in a dominant position in the grappling, and uh, go on to win this fight by TKO or submission. Some point in round one or round two, I'm going with Cowlin Lochran. The Don himself uh, will redeem himself and uh, win this fight in his second fight in the UFC. Plus, he's younger, 27 years of age, um, already shaken off the UFC jitters. I reckon he'll have a good time of things here against Angel Pacheco. Um, he did have a very tough time against Taylor Lapulus because Lapulus was just sort of staying at range, floating around, tippy -tappa sh tipping, tapping him with shots, whatever the fuck it is. I don't care. Uh, Pacheco has a three-inch less reach. He's going to be more there for him. I think Lochran's going to be able to outmuscle him, get him to the ground, and just be too strong. I just don't see a strong guy in Pacheco's build or a wiry, uh, rangy guy who can post up on long arms. Like I just feel like Lochran's going to be able to crumple his frame, and when he crumples his frame and gets a far side wrist control, he's going to be able to get a TKO, back mount TKO to ground and pound. We move on. Andre Petroski versus Jacob Malkoon. I mean, this is kind of like... Uh, Basically, the way I see this fight is they both kind of do the same thing. I'd say Andre Petrosky has higher finishing potential just because he's a more powerful dude. But I'm not even going to take that as he's actually good because I don't think he is. Like, Andre Petrosky is more explosive and, you know, he's a powerful dude and he could get the KO here. But we've seen over and over again his inability to get that KO. You know, he, he beat uh, Nick Maximov in an impressive submission. Great job to him there. Um, I just, I, we haven't seen that ability on the feet from him yet. And I feel like if you're going to want to get um, Jacob Malkoon out of there, you've got to do it early because otherwise he's going to wear on you. And it just sort of comes down to, they both do the same thing. Petrosky does it a bit more explosively, which means Petrosky slows down it a lot more than Jacob Malkoon does. And if they end up doing the same thing against each other, I reckon it's going to be on the volume and output of both the strikes and the takedowns of Jacob Malkoon that makes up the difference in this fight. So I'm going to go Jacob Malkoon winning this fight by either third round finish or second and third round wins uh, to a decision. I'm going with Jacob Malkoon. We move on. Up the card, Victoria Dudikova versus Melissa Garter. Um, well, this one's actually a tricky one to predict because uh, a lot of people are going to go with Dudikova, but... Um, Melissa Gato's got a good shot here as an underdog, but uh, uh, dude, it's hard to women's MMA. Like, do I just skip it? Like, what is the point at the end of the day? Um, she had a pretty close fight with Ari Ariane Lipsky. Melissa Gato did failed her takedowns. Um, I don't know. It might be worth picking Melissa Gato here over Victoria Dudikova because at the end of the day, we don't really know much about Victoria Dudikova. She's cute. But her last fight was an injury against Jin Yu Frey, who broke her arm basically out of place defending the takedown. Um, no, no, she won that fight. Before that, there was a dislocated elbow against Estela Nunes, but she won the fight against Jin Yu Frey. But I remember being not too impressed by her performance against Jin Yu Frey. If that was her last fight that she went to a decision in. And if that's the case, I mean, you should not be making it close against Jin Yu Frey. You simply should not. Be making it close against Jin Yu Frey. I'm going to find out if that's who it was against. And I'm going to find out if it was as close as I remember it being. Um, but I think Melissa Gato might be a bit more game as a savage out there. Um, yeah, I don't know about this one. Tracy Cortez fight with Melissa Gato was a close one. Let's not forget about that. She had a close one with Ariane Lipsky. 
Split decision, let's not forget about that. She beat Ciara Eubanks, who's a man. The Victoria Dudakova fight, it was clear for her, but it was getting to a point where I'm like, I don't like how somewhat competitive this is. So you know what? I'm actually going to go with Melissa Gato winning this fight. I don't know what the odds are. I would assume they have her as a slight underdog. They have her as the favorite. Well, I'm actually going to go with her. I don't even know what the odds are. We move on. Up the card, Ibo Aslan versus Anton Turkalj or Turkali. I watched their first fight with each other. Um, Ibo Aslan had some good low kicks on the feet. Um, he had some good moments on the feet in the first fight as well. There were moments where it was like, if any of these shots are just a couple inches in a different direction, Anton Turkali is out cold up against a cage in that first round. There was many moments where Ibo Aslan was going for a flurry and Turkalj just throws his hands away from his face and just prays to God that he don't get chinned. Um, they were muscling each other around in the clinch. Anton Turkali actually seems to have the much better durability in this fight. I don't think this was a situation where he caught Ibo Aslan with a rear naked choke, even though Ibo Aslan was winning the fight. It was more like Anton Turkali just saw a moment of weakness in that Ibo Aslan and, and put the pressure on 100%. Um, I do like Ibo Aslan's hands, though. I think he's got a good chance early, and I don't like that Anton Turkali has basically been smoked since he's got to the UFC. I mean, the Petrino fight was messy. Very, very messy. So there is a mo there is a chance that he could go out there and win this. But against Tyson Pedro, the way he was striking was just like, it was one of those striking performances where you go, yeah, you shouldn't be in combat sports. Like, you don't know how to throw hands. You don't know how to strike. You're not comfortable out there moving your feet. You know those people that just don't look right out there in the octagon. Anton Tokali looked like that against Tyson Pedro. And I don't like that he's coming off of that loss and jumping right back in there against, in his mind, I've already beat this guy. I'm going to win again. But this guy's on a four-fight KO streak, most of which against Cannes. The guy on the Contender Series fought Jamal Pogues. On the mixed results. Yeah, I mean, Jamal Pogues is involved in that guy's resume. So I'm, I'm going to go with uh, I'm going to go with Ibo Aslan, though. I am. I like his momentum. I like that he's on a four-fight finish streak. Um, I like his hands. And also, the way he finished the guy on the Contender Series was from sh like throwing shots around the guard. The guy's guard was in front of his face. He was throwing shots around it. Then the guy's hands came away from his face and he kept just looping. I just smacked my elbow, man. He just kept on looping shots around the guard of his opponent and knocked him out. And I think Anton Sokali, when things get tricky, his hands come away from his face and he just sort of stands there waiting to be KO'd. Why are you in combat sports? You don't belong. We're going with Ibo Aslan. We move on. Up the card, Dennis Bazooka versus Connor Matthews. Just a bunch of bums from Northeastern US. Fucking sick of them. Absolutely fucking sick of these bums from that part of the US. Come, come down uh, Southeast US, you know, Central, you know. You go anywhere else in the US, you'll find some good prospects. I'm telling you, there's a stinkiness of people coming from the Northeast of the US where they are absolute can crushers who fought Jay Ellis to get a win. Connor Matthews, I'm looking at you. And Dennis Bazooka is a Ray Longo guy. And you just don't know how good these guys are because they, they get babied into the UFC because they're already within such established, you know, um, gyms. You know, Conor Matthews is New England cartel guy. We know about the New England cartel, dude. You've got to check their records because they do set up favoritized fights for their up-and-comers. And it means that their up-and-comers don't ever get tested before they get to the UFC. They got, Kate, they got Rob Font and just went... Right, well, let's just, you know, Cater owns an organization out there. He does the regional shows. So it's hard to tell how good these guys really are. Um, but I do think Conor Matthews is better than Dennis Bazooka, which is a great name, by the way, for fighting. But um, I do think he's better. I think Conor Matthews is way better than him. Um, I liked his fight on the Contender Series. I thought he did all right. Um, I don't think he did that bad. Um, I really liked his fight on the Contender Series, man. I didn't like his fight on the Contender Series. But I did because he grappled hard and he pushed for takedowns and he scooped up great takedowns with great entries and really did establish dominant position on top where he needed it most. And I liked that he had that opportunity to go to that. Um, against a very tall and rangy guy that he was taking on that was throwing some heat at him and he managed to stay safe. 
I think if that tall, rangy guy ain't going to land on uh, Connor Matthews, I don't think Dennis Bazooka is going to be able to. And from what we've seen of Dennis Bazooka so far, smoked by Jamal Emmers, made look like he don't belong. And then Sean Woodson, he didn't have anything. Like, at least Charles Jordan had uh, scribble out a result on a scorecard and act like he won. Dennis Bazooka had nothing in that fight. Nothing for Sean Woodson. A couple tappy shots. A moment. But other than that, it was just full control. And I don't like seeing someone have full control over someone. So I'm going to go with Conor Matthews winning this fight. I think he's uh, closer to his prime. I think he's just better than this Dennis Bazooka guy. I think he's better than him. And I think the grappling can come into play as well. Conor Matthews, finisher. A lot of finishes in his career. Against schmucks at the end of the day. But, you know, he fought a good guy on the Contender Series and he won. So good for him. We move on. Up the card, Julio Arce versus Herbert Burns. Do you think Herbert Burns can finish Julio Arce within the first two minutes of this fight? If you don't, this bitch is curling up in a ball and crying his way out of this one. And you know he is. And Gilbert Burns is going to carry him. And you're going to have a cry together. A good old Burns family crying moment that they always seem to have. Not, not going to Gilbert Burns. He's a legend and a G. But Herbert Burns, there's a reason they called this one Herbert. Gilbert is the Chad of the two soyest fucking names I've ever heard in my fucking life. Herbert, though, even Sawyer, you know what I mean? I can't think of that name and not think of a, of a nonce from Family Guy. Like, what? you really got to really think ahead of time. When you're going to name your kid Herbert, think, will there be a cartoon that popularizes this name as the name of a nonce? Herbert Burns, disgusting. I don't think he's Burns' brother. This is Alistair Rovereem's little brother, and he's got about the same chin as him as well. So I'm going to go Julio Arce, surviving an early storm from Herbert Burns, where Burns is going to go for a takedown, maybe get it, maybe get the back, but Julio Arce survives and works his way out of stuff, and they, they get into some grappling exchanges. And I think the second that things don't start to go Herbert Burns' way, and that Julio Arce starts to get a little bit of momentum, we're going to see him break, and I think we're going to see him fade, and I'm going to go with Julio Arce, late second round TKO. We move on. Up the card, Werner Jandaroba versus Lupi Godinez. Now, this is another interesting one. Because Verna Jandaroba, is, ain't, she ain't half bad, I'll be honest with you. But I am going to go Lupi Godinez because I'm never picking Verna Jandaroba to win a fight. There's a rule I have. Not picking her. Don't care what anyone says. Don't care what results are, what this is, what that is. I reckon Lupi Godinez has the ability to keep this fight on the feet. I really think she does. Uh, Verna Jandaroba's got some good offensive wrestling, pretty decent stuff. And she did just beat Marina Rodriguez. But I think Lupi Godinez's grappling is good and she's a little ball of muscle for the division. Very hard to get under, very hard to keep down. And uh, I think Lupi Godinez will be able to keep this on the feet. And if she does keep this on the feet, um, I reckon she'll have a boxing advantage over Verna Jandaroba. She'll have a grit advantage. And I reckon she'll push for a decision win. 29, 28, maybe there will be a round where you're like, oh God, here we go. Verna Jandaroba might switch it round. But I think on damage, they're going to side with Lupita Godinez. And also, just if it's close, they're not giving a close decision to Verna Jandaroba. And most women's divisions are, uh, decisions are close. So I'm going to go with Lupita Godinez winning this fight by decision. Nate Lamware versus Jamal Emmers. I love Nate Lamware. One of my favorite fighters on the roster. Wish we would have seen him a little bit more active. Um, I reckon um, we missed out a large part of his career. He's 35 years of age now. You know what I mean? He hasn't been in there for a long time. Um, hasn't been in there since June of 2023. So we're going to be coming up on about nine, ten months since we've seen Nate Lamb wearing the octagon. And that's him at 35 as well. Now, I reckon Jamal Emmers is going to knock him out in the first. My honest take on this fight, Jamal Emmers knocks him out in the first. And I know Dan Ige wasn't able to, but I also think Dan Ige was taking steam off his shots, off his hooks, to try and land on Nate Lamware a bit more consistently. Because if you remember that fight, it basically was, Lamware's doing okay, he's doing okay, and at the end of the round, he gets caught. He's doing okay, he's doing okay, he gets caught, and he does okay in the third round. Um, but against uh, Austin Lingo, man, he was getting tagged. I don't like that at all. I don't like that he had to break and weather a storm of Austin Lingo. Austin Lingo is inferior genetically. He's disgraceful. DNA. Why? Don't maybe, maybe get Manel Cap in here. You know what I mean? He's not built for combat sports, Austin Lingo. Simple as that. 
Nate Landwehr was getting tagged by him in round one with his chin up in the air. Dude, Jamal Emmers has got the reach. He's got the speed. He's got the talent. I think he's one of the most underrated fighters on the roster. You go through his career, and what do you see? I'm going to read you some stuff right now. First of all, we lost to Jack Jenkins in a split decision. I think Jack Jenkins is extremely talented. I think he would have gone on to do quite well if he didn't get his arm snapped out of place by a Chet Mariscal and basically a fluke when he tried to post up to the stop a takedown. Um, this guy beat Kushane Ashkabov, who was 23-0. I know people say fraud check, fraud check. He was still 23-0 on the regional scene of MMA. That is fucking difficult to do. Fighting cans or not. Fighting cans or not is difficult to do. Beat him. Um, dropped Sabatini bad. Ends up in a leg lock on the ground. Sabatini, while semi-conscious, gets a submission over him. He beats Vince Cachero. Goes to a split decision with Giga Chikedzi. I like that. That was mainly a striking fight. He did shoot a few times, but um, that was mainly a striking fight. I like that performance by Jamal Emmers. You go further back on the regional scene. This guy beats, uh, what was it, Corey Sandhagen he has a win over. You know, he fought Tiago Moises on the regional scene, went five rounds with him, lost in the fifth round, but went five rounds with him. Julian Arosa, like, this guy's got sneaky names on his resume. Um, I feel like... Jamal Lemmers is going to be able to get this one done. Straight down the pipe, right on the chin of Nate Lamware, over the top, bang, cracks him on the jaw, puts him down. I'm going to, I'm going to trust that Jamal Lemmers can get this one done. And even if it does go to a decision, um, this ain't David Onama who gasses out. And I'm, I want to talk about that David Onama fight as well, because a lot of people are like, uh, you know, he gassed out. Nate Lamware put a hell of a pace on him. Dude, that decision... He got, Nate got dropped at the end of round three. I think he won that decision. He's lucky a judge didn't think he didn't. I'll be honest with you. Or a judge didn't think that could have been a draw. Like, there were moments where he kept getting wobbled. And I think Emmers is experienced enough to where he, if he gets a wobbling moment, he's not some young prospect who's like, oh, this is my whole life flashing. As soon as he rocks Nate Lamware, he's just gonna see Nate Lamware's face turn into a 50K performance bonus and go all out looking for it and maybe fail. No, this is a patient dude who'll set up his shot. And I think he'll get a vicious first round TKO over Nate Lamware and ruin the comeback party of Nate Lamware. I think it's a terrible matchup for him. And um, yeah, I'm going to go with uh, Jamal Emmers getting this one done. I don't think he wrestles. I don't think he needs to. I think he can stay on the, on the, on, at range on the feet. Lamware don't kick too much, too well, unless his opponent has slowed down. And David Onama in that fight, this was around the time I was watching James Krause's content um, to see if he had any tips or... Uh, info on any of the fighters. Little did I know that info wasn't entirely legal. But I used to watch some James Krause footage and I'd be like, what does he know about a certain fighter? Does he know someone's... Because he used to mention a lot of it on his YouTube channel. Um, and one thing he said about David Onama is that Onama never showed up for practice. And Onama trains with them. And he said Onama never showed up to practice. Onama never does cardio. He's an arrogant first round finisher. And he doesn't do conditioning. He doesn't condition himself appropriately like an MMA fighter should. And they knew he was going to gas out. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. And that guy was still able to put Nate Lamware on skates on multiple occasions. So I'm going to go Jamal Emmers. The time off, I don't like it either. I'm going Jamal Emmers TKO early. We move on. Chidi Nijikwani versus Reese McKeer. Now, annoyingly, I want to pick Reese McKeer. I'm not going to. I'm picking Chidi Nijikwani. But annoyingly, I want to pick Reese McKeer. Because middleweights and above are shit. And we've just seen Mikel Paya move up and smoke a few of them. Okay? I'm pissed off. Above welterweight, I'm annoyed at them. They annoy me. Their existence annoys me. I hate having to pick fights. Gini Nujikwani is not his first rodeo at welterweight. I'm pretty sure he's fought there at Bellator before. Um... Dude, he was doing all right against Mikhail Alexeychuk. But, dude, do we rate Alexeychuk anymore, man? Or is he just a shit man above welterweight? The Duraev fight. I don't like how he couldn't capitalize on Duraev on the fit. Oh, but you were losing to Ange Lusa, though. Like, this is the problem, man, with MMA. Like, they're all just a bit shit. A lot of them are just a bit shit. And he was losing to Ange Lusa, man. I don't like that. But he was being taken down, and that was a lot of the reason why he was losing. Ah, uh, Northern Irish people are so soy, though. They are the soyest of the Brits. No offense. 
They literally like saw it. I'm not in, and let's not get too political. Ah, uh, fucking hell. Now, you know what? I watched his fight with Jim Wallet on Cage Warriors. Some fucking old man, jujitsu guy. Good UK fighter, but 40 years old. Judo Jim Wallet. Uh, wow, he actually has judo in his nickname. Who was coming off a win over Figlak, Mateus Figlak, who's Mike Figlak's older brother, basically. And he, he KO'd him, and that put him in a good position to fight Reese McKean. And McKee still took him to the fourth round. So, you know what? Actually, I'm not. Yeah, I'm going to go Chidina Jaquani. I think he's more explosive, more powerful, more finishing ability. And uh, it's, it'll probably be the first time Reese McKee in a long time has fought someone his frame or larger since Hamzat Shemeyev. And that was basically sodomy. So I'm going to go with Chidina Jaquani. Reese McKee has long framed opponent flashbacks, skits his up in the center of the octagon and gets smoked in the first round. Bill Algio versus Kyle Nelson. Yeah, I'm going Bill Algio, dude. I'm going Bill Algio. I like this guy's game. I think he's an underrated fighter. I like this guy's game. Um, I like this win over, uh, oh, I'll think about it in a second. I know the guy's name. I like his win over Joe Anderson Brito is who I like his win over. Um, he shut down Joe Anderson Brito as well. He really, really annoyed Joe Anderson Brito to a loss, uh, when you watch that fight. Now, I don't like a loss to Ricardo Ramos. He's a coward. Quitter, shouldn't be in the sport. But I think he could have arguably beat Andre Philly and should have done. Watch back that fight. And you tell me what matters more, the fact that Philly had his back or Bill Aljo literally beating the piss out of him while he had his back taken. And it wasn't Volkanovsky Makashev having his back taken. It was Bill Aljo fucking beating the shit out of Andre Philly with his back taken. Heavy thudding shots of ground and pound, not little taps while riling up the crowd. No, he was trying to do damage. He was looking up, swinging big punches like there was a clip of Poirier doing it to Saint-Denis recently. Um, I think Bill Algio's sick. I think he's sick. I think he's got great takedown defense. His striking does worry me sometimes because he is there to be hit. But dude, he was in there with Joe Anderson Britt over three rounds and shut his ass down up against a cage a lot of the time. But he's tricky. He's tricky to catch. He's tricky to put away. And uh, we've seen that's why he's been a problem for explosive power punches like Alexander Hernandez. And, you know, I didn't like the fact that he wasn't doing too good against TJ Brown. But you know what? He got the finish and choked him out and dropped him. So that I'll take it. You know, Kyle Nelson, I just think he's too basic. And I think Bill Algio is going to weird him. He's going to weird him with some shit. You know what I mean? Use some weird, goofy shit on him. And Nelson's going to be like, Ugh, do I throw a jab, a straight right, or a low kick? And that's like the extent of his free options that he's going to have in this fight. And I think that's where Bill Aljo's going to win. I think he's got more options. I think he's got more ways of touching his opponent. And uh, I think that'll give him a win by decision. I'm not going to say finish. I'm going to say decision for Bill Algio. Now, Sultan Ruzaboev versus Boot Gang. I'm going with Nasultan Ruzaboev over Boot Gang. Um, Cedric Damas. Like, the guy that beat Cody Brundage, giving Cody Brundage the opportunity um, to fight against the legendary Bo Nickel. Like, this is the, this is the test. You know what I mean? This is when we found out that Bro Brundage was ready for Bo Nickel because he lost to Cedric Damas. And as far as I'm concerned so far... Cedric Dumas has won fights in the UFC mainly because of his opponents being brain damaged and retarded a lot of the time. That's his last two fights. Brundage accepting bottom position and doing nothing in terms of damage whenever he's, he got a takedown himself. Jumping a guillotine like an absolute idiot. Loser. Shit for brains. Spud for brains. Mush brain. Tard. Did that. Dumas wins that fight. Abu Zaitar. Mush for brains. Tard. Giving Cedric Dumas dominant position. Not doing shit on the feet. Trying to grab Cedric Dumas' hair on the feet because he can't fucking do anything because he's a fucking criminal loser who tried to set a man on fire in their Lamborghini and hold him hostage for money. Look it up. The Azaitar brothers are criminals. I have no idea how the UFC let them in. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go with... Uh, say, <laughs> wait, who's even fine? Oh yeah, and there's Alton Ruzabov. going to smoke this bitch. And also his win over Bruno Fajaya looks good because Bruno Fajaya recently had a good win, I'm pretty sure. Um, so yeah, that was a really good win for uh, Nasultan Ruzabov because Bruno Fajaya proved that he, well, he beat Phil Hawes though. So it's like, of course he did, you know, by KO. But I'm going to go Nasultan Ruzabov. He can grapple, he can strike, he's very experienced. And he wants to win and he's not spud for brains. 
So I'm going to go Nassalt and Ruzaboev via probably having above a 50 IQ, I think is all it's going to take here. We move on. Chris Weidman versus Bruno Silva. Somebody come get their grandpa. We don't want to see this old man hobbling around in the octagon again. His legs cooked. Get him out. It annoys me, man. It annoys me. He's 39 years of age. His family don't love him. Like, you can't have a loving family that sees Weidman's recent performances and goes, yeah, one more, babe. Oh, yeah, well, you'll go on one more, babe. Why not? They just want their bills paid. They don't care about you and your brain cells. Simple as that, Chris Weidman. And as much as I liked Chris Weidman's reign, I think he had an under he had an underrated time as champion, you know what I mean? Because he was the man at one point, you know? Um, he's now 15 and 7. You know? He's 15 and 7 now. And his grappling has not been a, a, a cause for concern in however many years it's been. It just hasn't been. And uh, he did beat Omari Akhmedov in a comeback fight, which was actually an impressive win because I thought Omari Akhmedov was actually a... I actually picked him to beat Omari Akhmedov, but I thought Omari was a respectable win for him. Um, but Bruno Silva just simply isn't a 39-year-old man who shouldn't be fighting because he has one fucking leg, and if Bruno lands a couple low kicks, it's cooked again. And you're not going to kick with it with the same confidence. You're not going to check kicks with the same confidence. You're just going to be a hesitant little skittish guy because you've shattered your leg and you shouldn't be in there. Bruno Silva's going to win by TKO. Weidman has no finishing potential on the feet, in my opinion. Um, his boxing is gay looking. I'm going to go Bruno Silva. I'm going to go Bruno Silva. Decision. I think it actually gets messy and Weidman does all right. But I'm going to go Bruno Silva. No, what am I going to... No, I'll say TKO. Fuck it, dude. We'll say TKO. Bruno Silva, TKO. Weidman ain't making it three rounds. Vicente Luque versus Joaquin Buckley. I like Buckley. I like Buckley. I actually root for Buckley. A lot of people don't like Buckley. A lot of people don't root for him. And, you know, arrogance, this. But I like a bit of arrogance. You know what I mean? I think that's what it takes to get to the top. And I like Buckley. And I, and I rated his win over Andre Fialho, although I did like Andre Fialho and I saw it coming and it was sad to see Andre Fialho lose. Um, I liked Buckley's performances. I really did. I don't think there's too much... Um, I don't like the Morono fight. There's not too much to break down in that one. I do not like it. He looked shit in the Morono fight. And Morono isn't built for combat simple as that you don't have a fast twitch muscle in his body i don't know how you can be skinny fat under 200 pounds like i don't get how you can't bulk and have some kind of muscle definition you know how do you have a belly when you're a 511 170 pounder get a grip of yourself man and take your fucking career seriously but morono is a full-time coach and i've watched a lot of morono interviews because he's actually quite a smart guy and I think he's actually mentioned me picking against him, I think, before. So, actually, I'm sorry, Morona. <laughs> but I've watched his interviews, and he's a smart dude. But he self-admittedly is a coach that if he likes a matchup here and there, he'll jump in and take it for the paycheck. Like, this ain't a guy with title aspirations. Even though you might think Joaquin Buckley's not that good, he was a guy with title aspirations. He's a guy who wants to win. He wants the glory. He wants the money. Um, and, and even in that fight, man, Buckley didn't look good until the third round. He did great in the third round. First two, take advantage of this weak little boy that you got in front of you, of Alex Morona. And there were times when he was rushing in where I'm like, dude, if anyone of any pop or any powerful hook generability, that ain't even a fucking word. If there's anyone at World's Weight who can generate a powerful fe uh, feet planted counter hook, they're going to put Buckley away. They're going to put Buckley away. And, um, yeah, I think that's what's going to happen here, man. Luke is very good at covering up and cracking hooks out from his guard. And I think Buckley, when he sees a guy cover up, he's like, I've got him. You don't have him. And it's happened a lot in Buckley's career where he's overthrown against someone who's covering up and using a tight guard. Chris Curtis KO'd him like this. Buckley will end up getting into these habits of, there's no jab and move from Buckley. There's no jab to the body and move. It's 
jump in, right hook, left hook, right in front of his opponent, right hook, left hook, body, right hook, left hook. And I think in those moments, we're going to see Luke, he can take pain. If you're worried about his chin, I don't think you have to worry too much against Buckley. Not known for one-punch knockout power, in his hands, at least. Um, but Vicente Luque is very good at a tight guard, and I think what's going to happen is Buckley's going to get overconfident and hyped up and, like, giddy over the fact that Luque's covering up against him. And then we're going to see Luque just darting out these hooks. They might not be as fast as Buckley, but he's going to wait for his time. And I think he's going to crack Buckley on the chin and put him away late round one, maybe round two. I'm going to say more likely round two. Um, where Buckley's really trying to get stuck in. But uh, I'm going to say KO for Vicente Luque in that very way. He's covering up. He's tucked behind his guard. He's looking at Buckley through his guard. Buckley swinging right hook, left hook, right hook. Trying to go all Buckley mode on him because he thinks he's Mike Tyson. And then Vicente Luque is going to go bust the Douglas on his ass. Knock him the fuck out. I'm going with Vicente Luque, round two KO. In that very way. I do worry about Luke, though, because he didn't look great against RDA. But now he's shaking him off. He's back. He's got his confidence again. I don't like the brain trouble that he had. But I like that he's now far removed from that-ish. I like that he's shaken off the next fight. Knows that he's not going to die if he gets hit with anything. I think he puts away Buckley. We move on. Up the card. Erin Blanchfield versus Manon Fiora. Um, You know what? I was very confident on Aaron Blanchfield. Very, very confident on Aaron Blanchfield. The more fights I've watched between the two of them, I don't mind the idea of a man on Fiorot getting this one done, but I am going to still go with Aaron Blanchfield to win. Um, in women's MMA, decisions are always extremely close. I thought Nami Yunus clearly beat Ribas, but you had scorecards on Twitter that had Ribas winning, and people still thinking Ribas got robbed. My point is... When it goes to a decision in women's MMA, it's typically very close, okay? Very, very close. You know, Manon Fiora, very close against Rose Nam Yunus, and Rose Nam Yunus had one arm or one hand after the second round. She broke her hand in that fight, and the bone was sticking out, so it's not like a fake excuse. She did break her hand in that fight, and Manon was still having trouble with her, okay? Now, Rose is from a lower division. She's a better striker than Erin um, Blanchfield, per se, on paper. You'd have to admit that. Blanchfield Chukagian was a very competitive close fight. You know, it just was. It was a very competitive close fight. Uh, I'm, I'm talking Fiorot versus Chukagian, sorry. Fiorot versus Maya. She won the fight. She won it very well. Idi what idi. She got taken down. She also got takedowns. They had some moments against each other. Um, the Mayor of Bueno Silver fight, she won it. But Tide started to turn in moments. And I think this was the fight where she got hurt to the body by Mayor of Bueno Silver, who was very big for women's flyweight, I will agree. One thing I'm going to say, though, is when there's a close fight in women's MMA, I'm always going to side with the girl that's more likely to shoot a takedown or two. Because a lot of time in women's MMA, they're very happy to let it go to a 29-28 decision, to a 48-47 split decision here. Some people say this person won. Some people say that person won. They're very often just people that don't really... Change it up. They strike. They're getting minorly outstruck. They just let it happen for the rest of the fight. They don't try and change game plan. I like that Erin Blanchfield will shoot takedowns. I know she'll shoot takedowns. And guess what she also will do? This is huge. She'll shoot takedowns despite not getting them. Against Tyler Santos, who outgrappled Valentina Shevchenko in their fight, she didn't get a takedown. It was, she shot 14 of them in three rounds. She didn't get a takedown. She came close. She ended up on top in scrambles that weren't directly because of the takedown, but they kind of were because they were in the, the takedown realm when she ended up on top um, because she basically toppled over Tyler Santos, but it wasn't an official double leg or anything like that. Um, but I like Erin Blanchfield here. I like that she's willing to shoot a lot of takedowns. I like that she can push a pace. I like that she's okay to hold up against a cage. I think that benefits her as well. She's very young, very young, 24 years old. Um, last fight was in August of 2023. She's had some time since then, seven months to develop her game, get right back in their main event. Um, and Manon Fiora, 34. Uh, I just don't think she's going to be able to stuff takedowns. In a five-rounder, I don't like her cardio here. I think Blanchfield is going to be the aggressor. I think Blanchfield is going to dictate where the fight takes place. Maybe Manon Fiorot can keep it standing for long enough. 
But I think Blanchfield will be the aggressor, which I think also gives her a, a, a favor in terms of judging decisions. I think it, I think it does. The fact that she's going to be the aggressor here, she's going to be the one moving forward. Um, she's the star of the UFC. Maybe not. Maybe they don't mind having Man on as champ. I'm not even going to look into that, actually. Um, Aaron Blanchfield, though, aggressive, uh, throws a lot, shoots a lot of takedowns, even if she doesn't get them, which I think she will be able to get them because I'm going to guess Manon Fiorot doesn't have as good takedown defense as Tyler Santos, who is a jiu-jitsu girl, who's been in there with other pure grapplers and has done well against them. Of course, Tyler Santos, I believe, shut down the game of like a, I want to say a Jillian Robertson and another grappler that she took on earlier in her career. I mean, she outgrappled Shevchenko very consistently. But yeah, we've seen her against pure grapplers, and she's been able to win those exchanges against them. Um, I'm going to go with Erin Blanchfield. I think she'll be able to push. And also, I watched back her fight with Jessica and Andrade. It wasn't what I remember. I'm not going to say that when she gets down Manon Fiorot, she'll just immediately sub her. I'm actually going to pick Blanchfield by decision, 49-46, losing a round two or a one, and then winning the others because of her takedowns. Um, but I liked her stand-up against Andrade. She was in the pocket, swinging with Andrade with straight calculated shots, popping her head back, and tuning her up on the feet a little bit with no fear. So I liked that from Blanchfield. Um, do I think it's a same style matchup as Manon Fiorot? No, because she's not going to be able to pop in and out as she will against a shorter and Drage with Fiorot, who's going to be on the back foot throwing a one-two and then side kicking her way out of there. Um, but that's another thing. I think there's a lot of catcher balls for Erin Blanchfield here. Manon Fiorot's got a good one-two and she's got a good one-two-three. Don't get me wrong. She's got a good piece-up combinations where she does well is where she starts getting that side kick going, when she starts getting her teep going, when she starts getting that head kick going. I'm not betting a head kick TKO for Manon. All I see there with a lot of those moves from Manon are grabbable things. Grabbable things for Erin Blanchfield to get her to the ground eventually. And I think she will get her to the ground eventually. And I think she'll win the fight because of it. And uh, I also think there's a lot of moments in this fight where she could get straight to the back of Manon Fiorot that a lot of people aren't talking about here. Manon Fiorot does a lot of turning her back on the way out of combinations. Wonderboy does this a lot, but Wonderboy is very... He's, he's a man, so different skill-wise. Manon Fiorot, the one-two, the sidekick. She ends up turning her back quite a bit. You know, she'll do a one-two, then a kick. Like, throw a, flick a kick out there at the end of her combination. And the kick will full crescent, background to her stance, and she'll be, like, overstepped. Her lead foot will be, like, further along than her rear foot, and it will be, like, kind of exposing her back. And she'll sometimes go for a spinning back fist. But I think that's a lot of opportunity for Blanchfield to just get a hold of her in a better position than just a simple over-under against a clinch, which is where she ended up against Tyler Santos. I think we'll see a lot of Blanchfield catching a kick, Blanchfield immediately getting the back standing and trying to drag Manon Fiorot down. I think Fiorot's going to be doing good, but I don't think she's going to gas. I think she's going to gas, and I think Blanchfield will win as the fight goes on. That's my prediction. Like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Toodle Pip, I'll see you later. Goodbye.